Good morning. Good morning. Good to see y'all. Um, this morning, I'm going to introduce our guest preacher. Um, we're going to continue to worship through the proclaimed Word of God. And our guest speaker, I met him 28 years ago uh, when I was pastoring a, a church in Denver. And our families just became very, very close. And Jeff was an elder in a, a fire church that we're um, bonded with in Valley Center, uh, San Diego, in that area. And then Jeff, um, about nine years ago, uh, they moved to Arizona. And he decided he wanted to try something different where he would just, the first church he went to, uh, look for, the, for one that is biblical, and we're just going to come and, and join it and serve. And so they joined a church called Highlands uh, in Phoenix. And Jeff started just putting chairs up and putting them away, and he never asked to do anything. He just kept serving, and eventually he served in the youth ministry to where he became uh, one of the preaching elders there at the church. And Jeff now, this was kind of a church growth church, and now uh, in nine years, every week, they're preaching verse by verse the book of Romans, and they're seeing massive transformation. I've never seen anything like it in my time as a believer. Uh, it's been a great experiment. He's still in it, still learning. There's beautiful things going on, and there's other challenging things. And so uh, we have asked him to come and share the word of God with us. And so I, I think the greatest thing I could share about my friend is he's a lover of Jesus Christ. He seeks his face. He's being conformed to his image. And so that'll be uh, the one who will be dependent on the Holy Spirit to bring you the word of God this morning. So, Jeff, if you would come preach the word of God to us. Well, good morning. Man, it is, it is wonderful to be here, not just because it's roughly 20 degrees cooler, but because... <laughs> It's just wonderful to be here, and, uh, and like uh, uh, my brother Ken said, we've known each other uh, you know, since, uh, I think it was 1994, uh, when uh, Kenny started influencing me with hyper-Calvinism, and, uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and uh, you know, we just, uh, we have such a wonderful, uh, joyful, playful relationship, and uh, I absolutely love uh, you, your family, uh, even Jordan sitting there. I mean, I love that guy too, you know. So um, it's wonderful. Our kids, we have four daughters. They are 28, 26, 24, and 20, so they kind of line up, and, uh, and our kids uh, did horrible things together. And so so we, we just have great fond memories. So it's wonderful to be here. Today, I'm truly hoping, and it is uh, in all of God's kindness and grace that I come to you, and I hope that today you leave charged and, and encouraged. Um, I oftentimes look at uh, different churches, um, as uh, uh, Kenny said, and I call him Kenneth Paul, right? As he, as he was talking about this grand experiment and, um, you know, this church that was, um, it was like more like being a part of a country club, uh, when we got there. And, and the challenge was not to go and uh, push or shove our uh, doctrinal views uh, or any of those things. Our, our goal within there was, could we grow where God had us planted? And could we be encouraged to submit ourselves to the leadership of that body and to just simply follow Christ? And to, in gentleness and in kindness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, could we, in fact, have an influence for a deeper, more reverent view of the Bible? And what does God's word say to us? And so I find myself now as one of, we do a rotating pulpit, so there's three of us that rotate, um, you know, every, every other, so to speak. And, uh, and I head up the counseling ministry. So it's been a great joy to be here with about 16 or so of you um, to just talk about uh, gospel-centered counseling. And what does that look like? How do we let our gentle and our forbearing spirit be made known uh, to the people around us? A phrase I use with a lot of our people is that God has entrusted you as an ambassador of the hundred square feet around you. And that's your job 
as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, to take all who encounter that hundred square feet around with you and love them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I hope today leaves you encouraged. I had great opportunity, and for years I've been so encouraged by your pastor, Ken. And you guys, I don't know if you know this, probably you do, right? But this is one of the greatest encouragers of the gospel that I've ever known. And his beautiful wife and the hospitality and the things that they do for people is overwhelming, right? So you have leadership. You have elders who I prayed with this morning, who, uh, who I've been able to be side by side. Brian, Relin, you, you just these lovers of Christ. I hope that you're so encouraged by these brothers who live their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that, that the way that you think, the way that you repent and take faith um, is taking from the things that you've learned and received and taking the things that you've heard and seen. Today, we're going to be in Philippians 4. And we're going to look at what Paul has to say. But before I go there, right, I just want to, I just want to read to you Romans 12, right? This is something I have to preach on in a couple of weeks. But Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and that by the testing of you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. But we look a lot of times to those models, those examples, those people that are around us, and we learn from them. You know, I see three things in our life. There's this ever-going conflict in our lives, and it's between what I believe and what I desire. I believe in a holy God. I believe in a sovereign God. I believe that the gospel has set me free from the bondage of the law, and I have been set free. But yet I continue to struggle with sin. Right? For those of you who know me, you might be sitting there saying, wow, that guy has lost a lot of weight. I've lost 110 pounds in the last year. And so with that, I sit there and say, okay, great. You've lost the equivalent of a seventh grade boy. Right? But you got a fourth or a fifth grader left to go. <laughs> and you say to yourself, right, you're, you're, you're trying to get a hold of why do I do what I do? And as I discovered, right, I had this problem throughout my life, and it was, it was this problem of going to the light. The problem is that it wasn't the right light, it was the refrigerator light. And you sit there <laughs> at midnight, and you're saying, man, you know what it would deal with my stress right now? Some comfort food. And that's just nothing short of idolatry. And as we wrestle with our idols, as we wrestle with our difficulties of life, God gives us, Paul is going to give us some great words here, some great counsel on how to deal with these insults, these tests, these temptations that come over us all the time. It's difficult, right? Because there's these, there's these socially acceptable sins and then there's these not socially acceptable sins. I sit there and I look at pictures of myself from just a little over a year ago holding one grandson and, and a new grandson, and it's like, wow, those are two radically different people. It's incredible how God will, in fact, transform and change your life. If you will just stand at the crossroad and wrestle with what you truly believe versus what your flesh truly desires. And what you do next will determine which bucket you just drew from. I think about this verse in Romans 12. This do not be conformed. I think of the, probably the greatest conformity of life, especially in our country, is standing in line. No one tells you to. You just walk to the front of the grocery store, and you may be sitting there in all your great wisdom saying, that looks like someone with coupons. I think I'll go over here. 
right? Or you're at TSA, right? You're going through the airport, you see the lady with five kids, rather than helping her, you go, okay, this one will be easier, <laughs> right? And this, this illustration, this metaphor of standing in lines, Paul's not saying here that as a Christian, because of the Holy Spirit, you're no longer obligated to stand in the line of life. He's telling you how to deal with the tests that are going to come while you're in that line. So in this word picture, we start to realize, right, what happens when someone takes cuts in front of you in that line? Right, maybe your approach to this cutter is to say, hey, buddy, line starts way back here. And you go at them rather aggressively. Or maybe you're incredibly passive. You sit there and just mumble and mutter and commit murder in your heart under your breath. Or maybe passive aggressively, you go to them in some sort of sarcasm and say, hey, I was just thinking, if you were to get permission from everybody behind me, I'd be willing to conform and let you stay here. <laughs> but is it possible that what Paul's telling us here is that you are the living sacrifice? Is it possible that your solution, when compared between your belief and your desire, is that maybe you're to trust God in such a way that you substitute yourself for them. You get out of the line and you go to the back so that they can stay where they're at. Maybe a lot like how Christ did with you in this world. When we start to look at things, I want us to have that perspective, that word picture. So if you'd like, turn with me to Philippians 4. We will start in verse 4 and go through nine. Paul says here, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let, a, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts. It will guard your mind in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received what you've heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What a world that would be to live in peace while in a tumultuous world. To look at this world through this lens in the gospel. As we go into this, I want us to just quickly pray. <clears throat> our Father and our God, we are so humbled by your word we're so humbled by your truth. We come to you now, Lord, and we say, would your Holy Spirit fill us with this wisdom, fill us with this truth. Help us to glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. Fill us with a peace that surpasses understanding. Help us to see your divine presence in our everyday life. And help us to be ambassadors of your gospel to everyone who enters around us. To your glory and your glory alone. Amen. So the first thing I want to point to here is the peace of God. I want to look at the peace of God as your guardian. We all encounter various emotions, and I like to say to people that emotions are a great revelation gift to you. They may not feel like it at the moment, right? Because emotions are given to us as a gift from God. They're literally screaming at times at you. You're leaving the path of God. Jesus said it this way. He said, be angry, but sin not. The problem isn't necessarily with the emotion that you're experiencing. The problem is if you're going to allow it to tell you to do what's next, rather than let it reveal where you're currently standing. You want to look at those emotions in a way that produces rejoicing. Because regardless of what's happening in my circumstances of my life, regardless of the people who take cuts from me in line, 
I want to be found rejoicing in the sovereign power of a holy and loving God. This can be difficult. The world will tempt you in this way. <clears throat> we'll start to realize that in these emotions that Paul has just covered to rejoice always. He even repeats it. But then he tells us on the other side of that, be anxious for nothing. So in other words, I can't allow my anger to overcome me. I find joy. And on the other side of it, I can't worry or have anxiety. But I find myself every single day having both of those. And I go through my life, and I have to examine where God has just brought me to. What exactly is he revealing to me in a moment of anger? What he's revealing to me is that I'm suffering from a blocked goal. And that blocked goal is what's preventing me from glorifying God in this moment if I will, in fact, be lured and enticed into acting upon that anger in a sinful way. Or if I find myself in anxiety or worry, I'm just lacking a clear goal. And it's an oversimplification to just simply say to a person, what you need to do is just trust God. We find people all the time that are going to tell us in our worry and our anxiety, man, I just think you need to trust God. Hey, you're not helping right now. Right? Just like when doctors would in fact tell me, hey, Jeff, after careful examination, we've determined that you're obese. Like, again, not helpful, Doc. I'm not sure all the education that you went through is actually up to par here. What I need to understand is what do I do? I don't need the definition. I'm aware of the definition. I'm cognitive of what's going on. But there's this huge gap that exists between knowing and doing. Now, I did this in my pulpit, right? And I was, I was there, and I preached, and I said that. I made fun of doctors. I'm sure some of you are doctors. Please don't do it. get greatly offended, right? But I, I, but I said, listen, if a doctor wants to be a good doctor, then you're going to help me do it. So, of course, I got a text immediately following that service from one of our cardiologists who said, I'm going to take you under my hands personally, and I'm going to walk you through this step by step. Ah, should probably keep my irreverent humor to myself. Because <laughs> now I have accountability. <laughs> like, wow, what am I going to do with that? I guess I'm going to do it. But Paul says here in this rejoicing, he's saying, if you're angry and not rejoicing, you're not on his path. If you're anxious, you're not on his path. If you are filled with a peace that surpasses understanding, you remain on his path. Now, some of us take that as a challenge in our attempts to minimize our sinfulness, and we want to either exaggerate our situation, even though life's all coming in, you're still the one smiling and saying, no, no, it's good, everything's good. How about just saying, it's not good. I need my brothers and sisters to come alongside and help me and to encourage me. How about telling a person, yeah, no, I'm angry. I'm really upset. And right now I'm personally wrestling with, is this my self-righteousness or do I have a righteousness of God? Am I here to turn over the tables or am I here to repent and take faith? But again, Paul wants to talk to this disposition, right? Right? Jonathan Edwards was the one who said that man makes his choices or his decisions based upon inclination or disposition at any one particular moment. Your hardwired sin nature is your inclination. You were conceived in this nature, you were born in this nature, but your disposition is your attitude at any one particular moment. This is the nurtured aspect of life. But Paul wants us to have an attitude, a disposition of rejoicing. And he goes right into five and he says, let your reasonableness. Oh, when you're feeling unreasonable, this is the worst word in the world, is it not? He means gentleness. He means let your reasonableness, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Because if you're rejoicing in God, then I can be gentle around God. If I'm angry and upset, then it's going to be rather difficult to have a positive attitude as I communicate what's going on. He says, do not be anxious. In other words, don't be fearless. Stand firm in the truth of God's word. How do I do this? By in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And then what happens? 
the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard what? It guards what? It guards your heart. It guards your mind. It fills you with this peace that surpasses all understanding. Because I should be going livid on the cutter in the line. But what I'm doing is saying, Lord, to your glory may this be. And so that I satisfy all the other people that are upset and dealing with this, the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have to remove myself from this line. I'm going to go to the back because I'm the living sacrifice. I'm the ambassador of the hundred square feet around us. And it doesn't mean that someone else isn't an ambassador, but it means that I'm going to be finding myself faithful to trust in a loving God. And maybe I don't get the best seat. Maybe I, I fail to get the product, the new phone, the whatever it is that I'm standing in the line for. But a question, so does that mean that I don't think with my mind or feel with my heart? By no means. Paul is saying that peace comes from God and therefore it determines how and what you ought to think. To use that grape between your ears to apply it to the word of God and to apply it to what needs to happen here at this moment to the glory of him. Not the glory of the people around me. But the peace of God, somehow it protects your heart and your mind from being anxious and to becoming reasonable and gentle and thankful and prayerful and joyful. The only way we can do this is that the God of peace is with you. It's his divine presence. This is the heart of the gospel. That when we live our lives, we live our lives in a way that is peaceful because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. Paul's going to say it so clear in verse 8. He's going to say, finally, brothers, right? Brothers, he's pluralizing it, so men and women. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, this is where I love, I love my brother Ken, because he finds excellence in things that I'm looking at and saying, that's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and he sees it as beautiful, I told him even this weekend, I wish I had his gift of encouragement the way that he does. I wish that I knew Christ the way that he knows Christ. But if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received, what you have heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So when you think about these things, truth, honor, justice, purity, loveliness, commendability, excellence, things that are worthy of praise, the very goodness of God, and therefore you take that which you have learned and received, what you have heard and seen, and you practice these things. The greatest gift you can give to this body is that you start to live the gospel in such a way that you're the ambassador of the hundred square feet around you so that everything doesn't fall upon one or two other people. Everything needs to fall. Our goal as a church, the universal church, this local church, is that 100% of the body would serve 100% of the body. <coughs> we have to practice these things, though. We can't just form Bible studies to talk about it. We need to actually go from knowing to doing. When you go from verse 7 where he says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what are you thinking on? Think on the presence of Jesus Christ within you. That he's here to guide you, to lead you. When we discuss in Christ Jesus, when he says this, in this verse, he says, in Christ Jesus, I want you to think by means of Christ Jesus. This isn't an opportunity for you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, to take your, your plethora of knowledge of God's word and lavish it and beat it upon a person. It is your opportunity to be a minister of God's grace. 
When someone sits in my, in my office, I have one young lady who's just started to come to know Christ, and she's on her third abortion, and she can't reconcile, but why? But why, Jeff? Why do you continue to love me with the gospel? I let you down. I let you down. I let you down. I said, it's not me you need to apologize. It's to a holy God who set his affections upon you before the foundations of the world and is setting you free if you would merely submit to him and follow him. I'm horrified at what you've done, but I love you because you were created in the image of God. How can I love you with the gospel? How can I help you see the beauty of Christ and all that he has done, his works, his righteousness, that if you would only repent, if you would only proclaim, if you would only put your faith and your trust in him, you will be set free from the bondage of the sin that consumes you in your regret and your guilt that you have murdered three of your children. I don't need to beat her up with the gospel. She's already beating herself up. I need to show her the hope of the gospel. Because what Paul says here, he says when the peace, this means of Christ, he gives us four great verbs. These four verbs are the growth in the gospel. To learn, to receive, to hear and to see. Paul tells us to practice these things. Practice what you have learned, what you have received. Practice what you've heard and practice what you've seen. Every one of you is equipped with God's poem. You are his workmanship created for good works. You are his poema. You're why you're here because you are the ambassador. You are the deliverer of God's truth. You are the minister of his grace. You don't have to know everything. The thief on the cross knew nothing, and he ministered to the people. He never participated in a Bible study or a small group. He laid there on the cross knowing that he was before holy God, and he shared his trust, his faith. He took his story... This man's done nothing wrong. He didn't quote verses. He didn't go through all those different things. He lived his life as the transformed person that he was in that brief moment. You, brothers and sisters, are adequately equipped to do the same. Because it reminds me illustratively of John 14. Verse 21, he says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Some people come to me and say, Jeff, it sounds like you're saying that, that this is a condition, that if I do this, then he'll love me. No. No. No, this is a validation of the fruit of the Spirit in you. He's just validating. Because if you practice these things, you validate that you're not of this world. Because you're not doing what the world would do. To practice these things validates a faith that is presence. It's produced by the peace of God, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience in his presence, which produces the practice of these things. It validates that the God of peace is within you. So what effect? What effect do these four verbs have on us? To learn, to receive, to hear, and to see. They all come from an outside source, a representation, a representation that is to, be in, uh, is, is to be imitated. Christianity is not... It is not something you create, but something you learn, something you receive, something you hear, and something you see. And you see it 
in someone else. How else would we come to it without the hearing and the preaching of God's word? You're that ambassador. The Apostle Paul is not inventing here four steps of highly effective Christian followers. Paul is, in fact, telling us the validation of his gospel and his truth. So when we look at these verbs, let's look at first learned and received. Learned and received is knowing that it is passed down or it is granted to you. It is passed down or it is granted to you. If we look forward a bit in Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13, it says this, I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound, and in every circumstance, I have what? Learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Through him who strengthens me. So Paul says, I know how. How does he know? He knows through experience. He learned as I have learned by what I have seen in me. Verse 9 is what he says. You need to learn as you've seen by me. I know positively in my own journey of faith what I have learned, what I have heard, what I have seen in your pastor has profoundly influenced me on how I am to act to the people in the 100 square feet around me. It compels you to live the gospel. It's something that is in fact handed down from person to person, and it is an attitude or a disposition. Paul says again in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. It reveals where you're at, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. More proof, more validation. For I delivered uh, to you, as of importance, what I also received. And what I received was this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He learned from his experience and he received from God. We receive from God that influences our inclination. We become a new creation. Right? Just like Galatians 1, 11 and 12 says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that revelation is that I'm a new creation. I'm powered by God. Received from God. But when we look at the next two verbs, we start to realize heard and seen. Personal and immediate witness is what Paul's talking about here. A personal and immediate witness. Philippians 1, 29 through 30 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw, what you've seen, I had and now here, right, that I still have. Let me read that again. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, right, that's the conflict. Belief and my desire. I believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. I'm the living sacrifice. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw, I had, and now hear that I still have. Get out of the line. Go to the end. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Practice what you've seen, what you've heard, through what you've witnessed in my suffering for his sake, for his glory, to be a living sacrifice. If we look backwards at Philippians 3, 17 and 19, he says, brothers, join in imitating me, Paul says. Imitate me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. I know many of your elders. I know your pastor. I know these guys. You need to take the example that they have of Christ in their life and apply it to yours. For many, he says in verse 18, of whom I have often told you 
and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and the glory is their shame with minds, the way that they think on earthly things. Stop doing that. Get out of the line. Get out of the line. Be not conformed. Paul, not with his mind, thinking, was not set on the conformity to the world. He was getting out of the line. Shape your thinking, your practice, by Paul's teaching and example. And by that, the peace of God, let all these beautiful things dwell in your mind because the God of peace is with you. So what do you think on? If I'm to change my mind, if I'm to think differently, what do I need to think about? Paul gives you a great list. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence in there or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How does this work? Why don't I do it? Why is there a gap between knowing and doing? Why do I forget who I am? I am a disciple. I am a follower of the person of Jesus Christ. Why can't I get out of the line? You see, Christ is in me. But why is my flesh so weak? This battle between what I believe to be true and what I desire to do. There's conflict there. We feel shame when we fail this test. But Paul has asked us to rejoice always, to be anxious for nothing. Why can't I just go to the end of the line? Why struggle to be a living sacrifice? Let me try to encourage you with a poem. This poem was written by a guy by the name of Ed Cole. Ed Cole was a men's ministries guy, Assemblies of God guy, but a lover of Christ. I want you to listen to this poem because I want you to be encouraged with this battle cry. Ed Cole says this, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I love that opening statement. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God even unto salvation. He says this, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The love of God controls me. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, slight walking, small planning, smooth and ease, colorless dreams, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed roles. I no longer need prosperity, position, promotion, preeminence, or popularity. I don't have the right, first, tops, recognize, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence, walk in patience, live by prayer, and labor with power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is the kingdom of God. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversaries, negotiate at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, spoken up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go on until he comes. Give until I drop. Teach until I know. Run until he stops me. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. You are a disciple of the Most High God. And you are the ambassador of the hundred square feet around you. How do I find joy in all circumstances? How do I, how do I be anxious about nothing? 
The same way I go to the refrigerator light. I have a pad of paper on it. And it's midnight, and I'm looking for comfort rather than the peace that surpasses understanding. And I pull that little piece of paper down, and the first question is, what's the lie that brought you here? What's actually the truth? What's honorable about that truth? What's just about that truth? What's pure about that truth? What's lovely about that truth? What's commendable about that truth? What's excellence that I'm standing here right now and God has revealed through my own anxiety that I'm in the wrong place, that I've left the path of God and if I will only go to the praiseworthiness of God and seek him in prayer and supplication, the God of peace is with me. I sit here before you today 110 pounds lighter because of that because of the word of God. As I wrestle with my own idolatry, I think about these things. I remind myself of who I am and who I represent. I look to Jesus and be, and I live. I want you to be encouraged by the means of Christ. When we see the gospel, my brother Ken, I will be your Timothy, your Titus, you're a son of thunder anywhere, any day. I love you, brother. Thank you for all that you do for Christ and his kingdom. Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> I know that what I've learned and received and what I've heard and what I've seen from you, your wife, your family, yes, even Jordan. I mean, please. <laughs> I wish to practice these things. I want to thank you for your faithfulness to follow Christ. Thank you for your faithfulness to these brothers and sisters, for being a model and ambassador of the hundred square feet around you. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to come to you and I'm just going to be honest. I need you to pick up the mantle. I need you to start to counsel your brothers and sisters, not in harshness of God's word, but in the beauty and the love of the gospel. I know many of you already do that, but we're not going to stop until our goal is met. 100% of this body serving 100% of this body. Would you love each other this way? Please. As I call the worship team back up, I just want to pray for you. Pray for this body. Our Father and our God, Lord, we are truly humbled by your truth, by your word, by this gospel that has set us free from your law, but encourages us and builds us to produce fruit, to have peace that surpasses all understanding. And Lord, we come to you and we ask for your grace, your mercy. We pray that we would grow in this grace, that we'd grow in greater and greater understanding of your Son. And that, Lord, as you entrust us with your truth and the people that you would bring in our path, that we would be faithful to love them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is to your glory that we wish to live. Amen.